Hello and welcome to lecture two of the reproductive system. This will be covering the female. Here's a quick glance at the female anatomy. Uh, we'll be discussing these major parts such as the clitoris, the vagina, the cervix, uterus, the fallopian or uterine tube, as well as the ovary and, and what's actually occurring inside the ovary. Begin with in the ovaries, this is where the eggs are going to be produced. We'll call them a follicle. They begin immature and they'll have follicle cells surrounding the actual egg or oocyte. Once you've gotten multiple layers of these follicle cells, it's called granulosal cells. Follicles go through several stages. We begin with the primordial follicle, which would have squamous-like or flat cells surrounding the oocyte. Once you see them turn and become cuboidal or columnar shaped, that's called the primary follicle. Secondary follicles where you begin to get granulosal cells, this is two or more layers. In the late secondary follicle, you're going to have quite a few granulosal cells, as well as the beginnings of the antrum, which is just this uh, cavity here in the middle of the fluid field. At the stage of the graphene follicle, the fluid field antrum is clearly present, and the follicle begins to make a bulge on the ovary, and it will actually rupture and eject the oocyte. It's almost like a, a volcanic eruption and occasionally women can actually feel a twinge of pain around day 14 uh, when they actually ovulate because it this literally blows a hole in the side of the ovary. Now the remaining follicle cells are called the corpus luteum and this job is going to be to maintain the pregnancy for quite a while until uh, the placenta takes over. That's assuming uh, sperm meets egg and you have fertilization occur which is typically in the fallopian tubes. If we take a look inside the ovary, this is a cross section. You can see we got some primary follicles here. Um, and you'll see the granulosal cells. You got more than one cell layer here. Um, this is the later secondary follicle. You're starting to see the antrum, as you can see here, quite large. This is where it's starting to bulge outside the ovary. You see the zona pellucidia. This is a a layer around the egg that the sperm are actually going to have to get through. This would be ovulation, somewhere around day 14 of a 28-day cycle. And you literally rupture in the side of the ovary. Uh, the corpus luteum, you see here. Now, this will be maintained if sperm meets egg. So, let's say fertilization occurs, typically right around in this area of the fallopian tube. This will be maintained and continue to produce progesterone, which is the, the hormone or pregnancy hormone, often called. Now, if fertilization does not occur, the corpus luteum degenerates over the next 14 days, and you have menstruation to follow. Looking at the female duct system, you've got the uterine or fallopian tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. The uterine tubes, or sometimes called the fallopian tubes, has a very thick portion, uh, pretty wide, right next to... Uh, the ovaries is called the ampulla. This is typically the site of fertilization. Now, the, the uterine tubes will have these fimbrae or finger-like extensions that are ciliated that will create a current that will pull the egg into them. Remember, the ovaries do not actually attach to the fallopian tube, so there is a chance that the egg does not actually go into the fallopian tube, and occasionally that egg gets fertilized and you have what's called an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, further down the uterine tube you see the isthmus. This is a real constricted region right before you enter into the uterus. The oocyte gets carried down the fallopian tube by peristalsis as well as ciliary action. So it's basically swept by cilia and rhythmic contraction of smooth muscles. Uh, Non-ciliated cells of the fallopian tubes are nourishing the egg along the way as well as any sperm that may be in there. Keep in mind this does attach to the uterus, but does not attach to the ovary. And the fembrae were the finger-like extensions we mentioned. Typical time, three, four days for the egg to travel all the way down and actually enter into the uterus. You can see a picture here. This would be the ampulla, this wide portion. This is where fertilization normally occurs. Uh, here's our isthmus, this narrow region before you enter into the uterus where the egg is going to implant. It's going to be one side or the other. Now, you know, a sperm, so let's say they've got through the cervix, you know, many of them died out here, and they're heading this direction. They've got a choice of going right or left. 
and an egg's only going to be on one side. So, you know, the sperm that's going the wrong direction just end with nothing over here. So you're only typically having one egg come out a month and it's down uh, one of the uterine tubes. This is a picture, uh, a blown up picture, of course, of ovulation. And you can see it's almost like a, a volcanic eruption. And now, as this egg is ejected, these fimbrae have this ciliary action to help pull it this direction, but it can go the wrong way. And it has been fertilized. And they've had ectopic pregnancies actually go almost full term and the baby survives. So they basically, you know, you cut the female open and the, the baby is not inside the uterus. It's actually outside the uterus. Now typically an ectopic pregnancy would have to be aborted. It's a very, very much a danger to the female. Just like a tubal pregnancy. If this egg gets fertilized and decides to implant in the uterine tube instead of in the uterus, you also would have to, to terminate that pregnancy. The uterus itself, there's your three functions. Receive, retain, and nourish. This is meant to hold the egg and allow it to grow into, ultimately, a child. Um, over a period of 266 days, give or take, uh, it's got great expansion capabilities. The opening into the uterus is the cervix. And the cervix typically keeps uh, the entry into the uterus blocked with mucus. That is except during mid-cycle. When you're ovulating, the cervix is open and, and ready for sperm to enter and then head up the uterus and the fallopian tubes and hopefully find an, an egg in the ampulla. The vagina has two functions. Um, obviously, it's for copulation and it is the birth canal. So it's going to serve both parts. It's the only two functions you can list for it. Uh, the urethra is right above the vagina embedded in the anterior wall. The hymen's a partial covering over the vaginal opening uh, that is there uh, ultimately until the person begins having sexual intercourse. Now, this can rupture you know, on its own, and this is not a guarantee of someone being a virgin or something like that. Though many cultures have traditionally um, used that to determine whether a female was a virgin or not. External genitalia, the mons pubis, is this collection of fat that sits over top of the bone. The preface of the clitoris is actually just like the foreskin in a man. Uh, the clitoris is your stimulatory organ. That would be the urethral opening for urination. Um, the greater vestibular glands, this is where you produce um, much of the lubrication for sexual intercourse. This would be akin to the bulbular urethral gland of a male. Oogenesis is the production of an egg. You see, just like in men, we, we begin with 2N, 46 chromosomes. And you go through two divisions, meiosis. And of course, these start activating um, during puberty. And they'll divide into haploid cells. Now, what's different about a female is you will get one really large, let's go back to slide here, one really large egg and then three polar bodies. You know, sometimes meiosis doesn't even happen back to the first polar body. You still end with four cells. It's just three of the cells are not really doing anything uh, for the female. And over here you can see the follicle side we talked about in the ovary earlier. This would be around day 14. This would be the corpus luteum. Mammary glands uh, exist in both male and female. Uh, they only function in women most of the time. Uh, occasionally you have mammary glands function in males. There's sympathetic pregnancy syndrome where the males will lactate. Basically, all mammary glands are is modified sweat glands. Um, and they actually secrete whole chunks of the female cell. So, when a baby's breastfeeding, he is literally eating his mother. There are chunks of the cells being broken off, so breast milk is actually a food and provides uh, the nutrition as well as the immune system uh, for the baby for the first few months. Each breast will contain 15 to 25 lobes. All of these cells are capable of producing you know, what we call breast milk, which is actually a food, and which are actually just modified sweat glands. Stimulated by sex hormones, uh, estrogens play a big role in the development of breasts. If you were to look in the cross section here, you see these lobules, uh, these alveoli, almost akin to what you'd see in lung tissue, or where the cells will actually break free, so tons and tons of mitosis. Anywhere you have a gland and you have a very high mitotic rate, 
you have the, the chance of cancer. And, and breast cancer is obviously uh, famous in women. It does exist in men. It's just not that common. And black tiferous ducks, this is where the milk will actually come from. Uh, there will be several of them you know, around the nipple. Breast cancer comes from those epithelial cells in those ducts. Uh, there are certain risk factors like not having a pregnancy or early onset menstruation, family history. But only about 10% are due to hereditary or family history factors. Now, if you know you've got these genes, uh, there have actually been women um, take the initiative and have mastectomies uh, based off their genetic data. Uh, before they were actually developed breast cancer, with the idea being if you go ahead and remove the breast tissue, there is no way for you to get breast cancer, which is true. But that's a very invasive surgery and probably not a choice everyone would make and pretty much elective. 70% breast cancer, no known risk factors, just occurs. This is a gland, and it's common because you have such high mitotic rates there. It's just like colon cancer or something else, where you have lots of mitotic rates. You know, you have a chance of cancer. Go back to the previous slide a second. Key, early detection. Self-examination, you know, if you notice something different, uh, a lump that wasn't there before, uh, go and get your mammograms. Um, if you have a risk factor, you probably want to get them, you know, maybe every six months instead of every year. If you catch breast cancer early, they can excise it, and they may not have to take off the entire breast. But typically, a mastectomy is removal of the breast, followed by radiation and chemotherapy. Um, and you're just hoping you get everything and you catch it early before it metastasizes to some other part of your body. You know, cancer of the breast itself is not dangerous because that tissue can be removed. It's the fact that it can metastasize and, and go to another place, like your lungs, let's say, where it offers much more deadly risk. It's a picture of a mammogram. As you can see, it's you know, pretty easy to look at the malignancy and tell. Um, so early detection, making sure you get your mammograms is crucial. That will be all for female reproductive system. Um, pay attention to all the organs of the female reproductive system and just simply go through and, and maybe pay attention to uh, their functions, as well as what's going on in the ovaries with the follicles and oogenesis, the production of eggs. It's just like a male, it's meiosis, but there is a difference. You know, females produce that one large egg, three polar bodies. Males produce those four equal sized 